Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 8. And this lecture is going to be on domain and range. So lecture 8, which is uh, section 3.2 in your textbook. Domain and range. Okay, so remember, in general, you can think of the domain as the set of inputs and range as being the set of outputs. So let me illustrate this by looking at a function as a set of ordered pairs. I'll start with that first. So let's say you're given the function Um, as a set of ordered pairs. So this is my function, let's say negative 3, 1, uh, negative 1, negative 4, 0, 5, 1, 3, and maybe two, five. Okay, so first of all, how do I know that this, remember, this is a relation, right? Any, any set of ordered pairs is gonna be a relation. How do I know it's a function, just as a review? As long as the x values, the input values do not repeat. So in this case, these are all distinct, right? They don't repeat, therefore it is a function. Okay, so we know it's definitely a function. So now I wanna find the domain and range. Well, the domain will be the set that consists of all the inputs, right? Negative three, negative one, zero, one, and two. So it's all the input values. The range is going to be all the output values. So in this case, it'll be 1, negative 4, 5, and 3. And notice, even though the 5 appears twice, when I write it as a set, um, we only write it once, right? The, the, you don't repeat values when you um, use set notation. So it's going to be all output values and I'll say um, don't repeat values because you don't do that in set notation okay what about what if the function is in equation form okay how do we figure out what the domain is if the function is in equation equation form so given a function, written in equation form, to find domain, So to find, I'll say the domain, you want to do the following. First of all, you want to identify the input values. Typically, those are your x values, right? But it depends. It does, they don't necessarily have to be called x. So typically x values, but be careful. So identify input values. Now what you do is you find um, any restrictions on the input
and exclude those values from the domain. So what do I mean by restrictions? I mean things like we know in mathematics you cannot divide by zero, right? So the d denominator, whatever that expression is, um, it can't be equal to zero. Or if I have a square root, then I know that I cannot take the square root of a negative value, right? Because that won't give me a real number. So therefore, <clears throat> um, if I have you know, a negative value, then it, it's not part of the domain. So that's what I mean by restrictions. And those are going to be the two main cases to in, in this particular class. Cannot We cannot take the square root of a negative value, because we're not dealing with complex numbers here. We're just going to end, um, deal with real numbers in terms of these functions. And we cannot divide by zero. Okay. So here's an example. So I'll start with one that is straightforward. Let's say I want to find the domain of this function. f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 3x cubed plus 2x squared minus x plus 5. Okay, so there's my function. Now, we want to, we first need to identify the input values. Well, input values are going to be the x values, right? And typically they're going to be x values. Are there any restrictions? Are there any x's that will give us a problem that won't give us an output, a nice output where it's undefined? Um, in this case, no, right? This is just a polynomial. I can plug in any x value and I'm going to get some particular output value. So in this case, all x will work. Let's say all x values will work. So there's no restrictions. So what that means is the domain is going to be all real numbers. And I can write that as an interval notation as negative infinity to infinity. Right? Remember using parentheses. So that would be my domain written in interval notation. All right, here's another example. Find the domain of this function. f of x is equal to 2 divided by x minus 7. OK, so if you look at that, it's a rational function, right? And we know that we cannot divide by zero. So that denominator cannot equal zero. So we there is a restriction. So the restriction is the denominator can't be zero. So how do I figure out what the domain is? Well, let me figure out what x value will make the denominator 0, and then I will eliminate that value from the domain, right? So the, the way that we do this is we basically force the denominator to be 0. So I'll set x minus 7 equal to 0. I'll solve it. So in this case, solve for x. So if I do that, I'm going to get x is equal to 7. So I know that if x is equal to 7, it makes the denominator 0. So 7 cannot be in the domain, right? But any other value is fine, right? 7 is the only problem value here. So any other input is fine. So my domain is going to be all real numbers except 7. But how do I write that in um, interval notation? So here, I'll, I'll write it out in words first. So with, the domain is going to be all real numbers except x equals 7. So to write that in interval notation, we can go from negative infinity 
two, seven, but not including seven, right? And then union, start at seven again, but not including it all the way to infinity. So that would be my domain written in interval notation. By the way, if you wanted to write this like in set builder notation, you could say, you know, the domain, here's another way of doing it. Although interval notation will be used the most in this class, but you could also write it this way. It's a set of all X such that X is not equal to seven, right? That will also tell us all real numbers except X equals seven. Okay, what about this one? Find the domain of f of x is equal to the square root of x plus 4 over x minus 8. Okay, so now if we look at that function, there's actually going to be two restrictions, right? So the restrictions are that the denominator can't be 0. And the radicand, so the thing underneath the radical, can't be negative. So I'll say and radicand can't be negative. Okay, so to figure out um, the domain, let me figure out where First of all, let me figure out where the denominator is zero. So I'll set the denominator equal to zero and solve it. So if x is equal to eight, the denominator is zero. So I know that the domain is gonna include every value except x equals eight. Now I have to do the further restriction that the radicand cannot be negative. So what does that mean? It means that the expression underneath the radicand, x plus four, must be greater than or equal to zero, right? That means it's non-negative. So I can solve this. In fact, all you need to do is subtract four from both sides, and you're gonna find that x is greater than or equal to negative four. So my domain is gonna be all x greater than or equal to negative four, but not equal to eight, right? So how do I write that in um, interval notation? Remember when I solve for x equals eight here, what I'm saying is, um, so x cannot equal eight because it'll make it undefined, right? That's what makes the denominator zero, x equals eight. So we're talking about the domain, x can't equal eight. But x also has to be greater than or equal to negative four in order for the radicand to be non-negative. So if I put these together, then my domain is going to go from negative four, including it, to eight, right? Because I don't want to include eight, so don't include eight. Union, and then everything else from eight to infinity. So that would be my domain. Okay, what about this one? Find the domain of f of x is equal to x plus 3 over x squared plus 11x minus 12. Okay, so again, my input values are the x values, right? If I look at the numerator, that's fine. I don't have any issues with x values. There's no square root in the numerator, right? That's fine. But the denominator, the entire denominator, I cannot let that equal to zero, right? If it's equal to zero, then I'm going. it's gonna be undefined. So whatever values of x, whatever values of the input make the denominator zero, they are not in my domain. So to figure them out, I have to set the denominator, that expression, equal to zero and find out what x's make it zero. So I will set the denominator 
equal to zero. Well, again, this is just a quadratic equation. We've had a lot of experience and practice doing this. Um, you should try factoring. It looks like it will factor. So x times x, right? And then want two things to multiply, give me negative 12, and add it, give me plus 11. So I guess a positive 12 and a negative one will work. So when I solve this, one solution is x is equal to negative 12. And the other solution is x is equal to positive one. So remember, those are the values that x can't be, right? They, they're not in the domain because they make that denominator zero. So the domain is basically going to be, and anything else is fine. So it'll be all real numbers except x equals negative 12 and positive 1. Now, how do I write that in um, interval notation? Well, I would start at negative infinity, go to the smaller number, which is negative 12, but not include it, union, start at negative 12, but again, not including it, go to 1, not include it, union, 1, 2, infinity. So that would be my domain for that particular function. Okay, what if you're given um, a graph? How do you find the domain and range of a graph? Basically, you just read off, right? You read off the input values and the output values. So, finding domain and range from graphs. So if we have some graph, of a function, right? Let's say it does this, I don't know. Um, let's say it starts here and does something like this. Let's say it goes on forever like that. So the domain is going to be all of these values. Right, so it's the x values or the input values to that function. And the range, so this doesn't get any lower than that, it'll start there and go up. It'll be all the output values. So the domain, um, you can think of it as all possible inputs. And the range is going to be all possible outputs. And you can read these directly from the graphs, right? So for example, let's say we're asked to find the domain and range of this graph. So this is x, this is y, which is also f of x. Um, and let's say it does this. Let's see if I can draw this. So let's say it increases, which is a peak there. Which is a low point there. And then let's say it goes up to here. And let's say this is filled in and this is open. Let me make emphasize that this part, this piece is open. 
Okay, so what is the what is the domain of that um, function, and what is the range? So domain, and then range. All right, so what are all the possible input values? Well, it looks like um, it starts at negative three, right? But not including because I have this open circle here and goes all the way to three, but including that one because it's closed. So I would say the domain is parentheses negative three comma three and then square bracket because it's closed on that end and then the range well it looks like it's going from again it's hard to draw this right but i have it this is this point is supposed to be two two or sorry two negative two let me write that here so two negative two is that point right there and then this point right here is going to be negative one three Right, right there. So the range is, th is then going to be um, negative 2, including it, all the way to positive 3. Okay, because it goes from, goes from here all the way up to here, right? All those values are the outputs. And some of them repeat, right? Which is fine. So this is a function, but it's not a one-to-one -one function because it fails that horizontal line test. Okay, what about, um, since we talked about the, the basic toolkit functions last time, let's look at each of them and figure out what their corresponding domain and ranges are. So domain and range. Of the toolkit functions. So remember the first function was a constant function f of x equals c and it looks something like this right it was just a horizontal line where this point right here would be like 0 c so what is the domain what is the range of that constant function and we'll do all we'll do this all in interval notation well the domain is any x value right like all all these x values are fine for the inputs and the output is always going to be just that one value c so i'd write the domain as negative infinity to infinity and then the range is going to be c and it goes to itself c right that means just include that value c okay the identity function which is f of x equals x. Remember that looked like this. Just linear line at a 45 degree angle. So in this case, it looks like the domain and range. And by the way, remember these go on forever, right? They'll put little arrows there, go on forever. So the both the domain and range in this case are gonna be all real numbers. So negative infinity to infinity and range is also negative infinity to infinity. Then we had the absolute value function. So absolute value, that was f of x is equal to absolute value of x. And that looked like this. Something like that. Let me draw that a little better. So something like that. So in this, and again, remember it goes on forever. So in this case, the domain is again all real numbers, but the range is gonna be only non-negative values. So it could be zero, 
because that point zero zero is there all the way to infinity. Okay, then the next one was the quadratic. That was f of x equals x squared. So that looked like this, right? It was a parabola, something like that. So the domain in range, the domain again is all real numbers, right? There's no restrictions, but then the range is um, only non-negative numbers again, right? So that's gonna be from zero, including zero, all the way to infinity. Okay, then we had the cubic f of x equals x cubed. That was like this. Kind of got flat there, right? And then back down. So in this case, it looks like the domain and range are both all real values, all real numbers. Then reciprocal so that was f of x equals 1 over x or remember we could also write it as f of x equals x to the negative 1 either way that looked like this it was a hyperbola so it looked like that and then like that. Again, let me see if I can do this a little more neatly here. It gets closer, closer, and closer to the x-axis. So, so something like that. Um, so the domain in range. Well, the domain is going to be all x values right, except zero, because I can't put zero in there. And it looks like the range is all y values except zero. So then the way we can write that is the domain is negative infinity to zero union, and I'm not including zero, zero to infinity. And the same thing for the range. Negative infinity to zero union zero to positive infinity. Okay, then a few more. We have reciprocal squared. That was f of x is equal to 1 over x squared. Or we could also write it as f of x is x to the negative 2, right? That looked like this. So something like that, right? Where it got closer and closer and closer to the y-axis as it got larger and larger. As the values got closer and closer to the zero from both sides. So the domain is again all x values except zero. So negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity. And then the range, looks like the range is from zero to infinity, but not including zero, right? Because it just gets closer and closer to zero, but doesn't actually include zero. So I have to use parentheses zero comma infinity. Okay, then we have the square root function. So that was f of x equals the square root of x, or we could also write as f of x is x to the one half. Remember that looked like this. It was a sideways parabola and <clears throat> the x values can't be negative. So it starts at zero, zero, and then it goes like this, right? So in this case, the domain 
in range. The domain is going to be from um, 0 to infinity, and including 0, so 0 is okay, to infinity. And then I guess the range is going to be the same thing, right? 0, including 0, to infinity. So again, the domain, all the input values, range, all the output values. And then the last one we did was the cube root. So that was f of x equals the cube root of x. Or I could write it this way, f of x is x to the 1 third power, right? Same thing. That looked like this. gets so something like that so and it looks like in this case the domain and range are all real numbers again right so domain and range negative infinity to infinity and same thing for the range right all real numbers for both of them okay so those, again, were all the toolkit functions. Remember, those are going to come up over and over and over again throughout the course, so it's nice to look at um, each one of them in terms of domain and range. All right, here's another question um, involving the domain and range of a function. And then I'll move on to a different topic. Find the domain and range of this function. f of x is equal to negative square root of 2 minus 3x. OK, so domain. Well, we have a restriction, right? The restriction. is the radicand can't be negative. It could be zero, but it can't be negative. So how do we write that? Well, the way to write that is to say that the, the radicand, which is the expression 2 minus 3x, must be greater than or equal to zero. And then I can solve this, right? I can solve this inequality to figure out what x's satisfy that. Well, how do I solve this? We talked about this in an earlier um, lecture. I would solve it as if it's an equation. So subtract 2. Then I need to divide by negative 3, right, to get x by itself. And remember, this was the one thing where, the one exception, if I divide it by a negative number or multiply by a negative number at any step, I have to change the sense of that inequality. So it becomes less than or equal to, and then negative two over negative three is just two thirds. So that's gotta be the domain. The, if X is less than or equal to two thirds, it's gonna be fine, right? So how do I write that? I can write it as negative infinity comma, Two thirds, and then because I have the equals here, I can include the two thirds, right? So that'd be the domain. And then the range, well, we have to think about this, right? If we go back to that function, what are all the possible outputs? Well, normally, like if this if this negative weren't here at all, then it would just it would go from zero to infinity, right? But since the negative is there, it's gonna make the whole thing negative. So I guess it can go from zero to negative infinity, or from negative infinity up to zero. It can be all negative values, including zero. So the range we can write as negative infinity, comma, zero. Right? Those are all the possible output values, zero or negative. OK, now sometimes. Um, a function has to be given in pieces, right? Where you separate each part. Each part has its own like domain. So let's talk a little bit about piecewise functions. So 
So I'll say graphing piecewise functions. So a piecewise function, let me define it first. is a function in which more than one formula is used to define the output. So in which more than one formula is used to define the output. Each formula has its own domain. So you, you can think of it like this, right? The function f of x, well, it's going to be equal to, say, the first formula. I'll call this formula 1, so the first piece, if x is in domain 1. You'll use the second piece, formula 2, if x is in domain 2, and so on and so forth. You can have any number of pieces that you want. So two or more. I'll just draw three here. So And then use formula 3 if x is in domain 3. Okay, so and actually one of our toolkit functions can be written as a piecewise function. Do you guys remember which one? So which so we've already seen a little bit about piecewise functions. So which toolkit function can be written as a piecewise function? Well, if you remember, it's the absolute value function, right? Remember f of x equals absolute value of x? I can write it like this. I can say f of x is equal to, well, it's equal to x if x is greater than or equal to 0, right? So like um, absolute value of 2 is 2. Absolute value of 4 is 4, and so on. And it's equal to negative of x if x is less than zero. So like absolute value of, um, here I'll do the first, absolute value of two, I would use this piece, right? Since x is greater than zero, I use this piece. So it's saying the output is also two. So this is just two. But if I do like absolute value of negative three, then I have to use the second piece because x is less than zero at the input, negative three is less than zero. So the output is saying it's negative x. Well, negative, negative 3 is equal to 3. And we know that's the absolute value of negative 3 is positive 3, right? So it makes the output always positive. So one way of writing the absolute value function is you can write it as a piecewise function. All right. Um, so how do, how do we evaluate them? Well, you just have to look at the particular piece, right? So let's say you're given... Um, this piecewise function f of x equals say it's 2x minus 7 right if x 
is less than zero. And let's say it's 2x minus 14 if x is greater than or equal to zero. And we want to calculate, so we want to find f of negative 1, say f of 0, and say f of 2. Okay, so let's do each of these. So f of negative 1. So my input, right, is negative 1. So what piece do I use? Do I use the first piece? Do I use the second piece? Well, if it's negative, then that means x is less than 0. So I have to use this first piece. So I go to that expression, that first formula, and where I have an x, I plug in a negative 1. So this would be 2 times negative 1 minus 7. So then this is going to be negative 2 minus 7, which is negative 9. So f of negative 1 is negative 9. For the second one, I want to find f of 0. Okay, so what piece do I use? Well, not this piece, right, because this is only if x is less than 0. This one is if x is greater than or equal to 0. So it's that equal to part that makes it this piece. So I have to use that second formula. So where I have an x, I'm going to plug in 0. So this is going to be 0 minus 14, which is a negative 14. So f of 0 is negative 14. And then finally, f of 2. Well, what piece do I use? x is equal to 2, so that's greater than or equal to 0. So I have to use the second piece. So where I have an x, I'm going to plug in a positive 2. So this is going to be 2 times 2 minus 14. So this is basically 4 minus 14, which is negative 10. So you just have to look at the input, figure out um, where it is in terms of the domain, then use that correct formula for that domain, right, for that particular input. Okay, so here's an example with, with a graph. So based on the graph, write the piecewise function. Okay, and I'll do, I'll do this in uh, decimal so it comes out nicer. Okay, so there's our piecewise function. And we want to write the function out in functional form, right? So I want f of x equals, it looks like there's going to be three pieces, right? So actually, be, before I write the, the formula for each piece, let's write the domain for each piece. So if I look at this first piece right here, it's going from negative 5 to negative 2, right? So the inputs are going from negative 5 to negative 2, but not including negative 2. So that means, in this case, it's going to be if x is greater than or equal to negative 5 and less than negative 2, right? For the second piece, it's going from negative 2, including negative 2, all the way to 1, right? Those will be the inputs, the x values. So how do I write that? Well, that's going to be if x is greater than or equal to negative 2, because it includes it, and then less than 1. And finally, for the third piece, the input goes from 1, including 1, all the way to 5, including 5. So I'd write that as if x is greater than or equal to 1, and then less than or equal to 5. Okay. But what are the outputs? Well, it looks like they're just constant functions, right? They're just horizontal lines, so they're, so they're constant functions. So for the first piece, when x is greater than or equal to negative 5 and less than 2, what's the output? The output is negative 3. It's just a constant negative 3. So that's, so it's negative 3 if x is greater than or equal to negative 5 and less than negative 2. What about the next piece? Well, it's equal to negative 1, right? So the output 
If the input is between negative 2 and 1, including negative 2 but not including 1, the output is a negative 1. Right? Each of those values is a negative 1. And then finally, the last piece, if the input is between 1 and 5, what's the output? Well, for each of these values, everything in there between 1 and 5, the output is always positive 2. So this is going to be 2. So that would be the piecewise function, right? It's just three constant pieces, right? Three constant functions that are pieces of that piecewise function. Okay, let's um, let's do one more where we go the other way. Let's I'll give you guys a piecewise function. Let's try and sketch the graph of it. So let's say we want to sketch a graph. of this piecewise function. Um, f of x is equal to, let's say it's negative 3 if x is less than or equal to negative 1. It's equal to 2x minus 1 if x is greater than negative 1 but less than or equal to 2. And let's say it's equal to 0 if x is greater than 2. Okay, now actually first thing I should mention is what is the domain of that entire piecewise function? Well it's going to be the union of those three smaller domains, right? So let me let me write that so you have that. So the, the domain of the piecewise function is the union of these smaller domains, right? The pieces. So actually in this case, right, x is less than or equal to negative one. That's gonna be negative infinity to negative one, including it, right? Union. Then x is greater than negative one, so not including it, to two, but including union, and then greater than two, so two infinity. But if you look at that, right, there's no gaps. This is the same thing as negative infinity to infinity. So it looks like for this piecewise function, the domain is all real numbers again. Right, because you might say, "Oh, I'm not including the negative one there, but I am including it here." So actually, there's no gaps if you if you add, if you look at all three of those together, it's just going to be all real numbers. Okay, so if you want a domain of a piecewise function, just put the pieces together. So it's the union of these smaller domains. All right, but in this case, we want to we want to try and graph this, right? So let me draw a little coordinate system. So I have, let's see, one, two, three, So this is x, this is y. All right, let me start with the first piece. So when x is less than or equal to negative 1, the output is negative 3. So when x is anywhere in here, right, less than or equal to negative 1, that's my input, then the output is negative 3. So that means it's going to look something like, like that. And it goes on forever, right, to the left. Including negative 1, too, right? So you could, for now, you could fill this in. We may not need it later, but I'll fill it in for now. Okay. Now, what about the second piece? The second piece is sort of the, the linear piece, right? 
it's equal when x when x is greater than negative 1 so slightly more than negative 1 all the way to 2 including 2 then the output is this function right here so what you might want to do is draw a little table for that piece and the x is never exactly equal to negative 1, but it gets very close to it. So I'm going to put negative 1 as one of my input values. And then maybe 0, 1, 2. Right? It goes all the way to 2. And you could even do more if you want within that interval from negative 1 to 2. So what are the outputs? Well, if I plug in negative 1, what's 2 times negative 1 minus 1? Well, that's going to be negative 3. Right? So that's negative 3. If I plug in 0, 2 times 0 minus 1 is negative 1. If I plug in 1, 2 times 1 is 2, minus 1 is 1, so that's 1. And if I plug in 2, 2 times 2 minus 1 is 4 minus 1, which is 3. It's 3. So I definitely have the point negative 1, negative 3, where it gets closer and closer and closer to that, basically. 0, negative 1 is here, right? 1, 1 is here. And then 2, 3 is here. And I know that it's linear. So th this is just a line that goes through all those two points. So something like that. And since it includes, right, it includes 2, it's x is less than or equal to 2, then this is going to be filled in here. Okay, and then finally, when x is greater than 2, so when x is 2 or greater, right, if the input is anything larger than 2, then the output is going to be 0. So I'm, I'm going to stay right on the x-axis. So it's something like, something like this to the right, but not including that, right, because really at 2, the output is 3. So not including that, but then everything else to the right is fine. And by the way, in this case, since since this point kind of blended in and met up with this point, you don't need to put a solid, um, a filled in circle here. So let me let me note that you don't need a filled in circle. because they meet already, the values already match up, right? They already meet. In fact, if you put in a filled in circle on, if you do this on my open math, it'll mark it slightly wrong because of that. All right, um, that's it. Actually, let me let me do this out nicely on Desmo so you can see this, um, and then that'll be it for this particular lecture. So if you plot it nicely on, on Desmos, then this is the graph that you get. So it's exactly like ours, except it's a lot nicer, right? Because it's uh, it's exact. And again, notice that here at negative 1, 3, there, you don't have to put in a filled in circle because it exactly meets anyways. But here you need one, and then it jumps down, and then this is it's only 0 when x is greater than 2, right? So that's why it's an open circle there. Okay, great. That's it for this lecture. Um, the next lecture, we will talk about rates of change and behavior of graphs. So basically talk about slopes and things like that. Thanks.